Hudson Hawk. Here's how I like them, and I suggest you have them the same way. Nothing but trouble. I'm Colin McLeod of the Clan McLeod. I was banished from the planet size 500 years ago. Highlander 2, The Quickening. Now, what could these films possibly have in common? Well, either Gene or myself, and maybe both of us, believe they are among the worst films of the year, The Dogs of 1991. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Sisko of the Chicago Tribune. I'll tell you one thing we do agree on, I have a feeling, and that is Highlander 2, The Quickening, is the worst movie title of the year. <laughs> now let's get to the worst movies of the year as movies. In terms of talent wasted, I'd have to say right off the bat that Scenes from a Mall ranks as one of the biggest disappointments of the past year. Bette Midler and Woody Allen in the same film as a married couple? Well, the very idea of that is funnier than anything in the movie. The story? On their 16th anniversary, they tour a Los Angeles shopping mall buying gifts and arguing with each other, but it turns out they've both had affairs. The news is greeted with a horrorous of slapstick anger. You know, I think a lot of wives would not understand this. You know, they would say, I make a big thing out of this, but, but, you know, the thought of remarrying is such a sophisticated concept. I love you. I really, oh, really honey. love you. You are the most oh, oh, selfish, short-sighted, oh, 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 oh,
Besides, you shouldn't be looking at me when I'm naked. Why not? I used to see you naked all the time. Well, it's different now. This isn't a sequel, this is a theft. And of all the idiotic plot developments, the one that I liked the least was the arrival of a visiting ship, which comes as nearly as I can tell for the sole purpose of providing two passengers, a seductive young girl to seduce the boy castaway and then a lecherous and lascivious sailor to chase the girl castaway around the island before he is eaten by a shark. They chase him out into the shallows so the shark will get him. It's movies like this one that make me realize the original Blue Lagoon with Brooke Shields and Christopher Atkins probably wasn't as bad as I thought it was at the time, not even with that scene of the turtles discovering sex. You know, <laughs> if you're going to steal a script of a movie, you steal why, a good one. Yeah, why, why script <laughs> the Blue Lagoon? I mean, it just, it, it's ridiculous. And it is... You, the sexual discovery thing, it's a tiny issue. If you do a little of it, okay, everyone can hide and say, you know, I enjoy it, I'm titillated by it. Yeah. But if you do it the length yeah. and, and have nothing else supporting it, then it just stands out as kind of dirty and dumb. I think they kind of wanted to sell this as soft core porn well, in a yeah, way, but yeah. it wasn't really, you know. It's not that good. Get the bathing suit <laughs> issue of Sports Illustrated and be done with it. Okay. <laughs> next movie, and my next selection is a pathetic self-help dance studio musical called Steppin' Out, in which dance instructor lies <laughs> Mentally transforms a bunch of shy, clumsy misfits into a high-stepping chorus line just in time for the big citywide talent show. You're kidding. No. Just in time? Just in time. <laughs> Here's the disastrous rehearsal. <laughs> no. And here's some of the disastrous dialogue. No. That's a mistake, imitating a line from My Fair Lady. That only underscores how weak stepping out is as entertainment. The script practically begs us to like it with sentiments like, please like these characters, because if you don't, they might commit suicide. I mean, that's really the drama here. Why couldn't these characters be written as more intelligent? Why couldn't this have been an adult version of a chorus line? They still didn't make a good chorus line. Why make it a bunch of, about a bunch of ninnies? You know, when I see a movie like this, uh, often they have a lot of characters. Right. Every character has a problem. problem. And the problem is all going to be solved at the end. Now, I happen to have seen this on the stage, so I knew some of the characters problems already and what was hilarious about the movie was they cut out some of the problems probably for time while leaving in the behavior so that for example you never really found out exactly why Shelley Winters was so mad all the time That's true. she's over there behind the piano pounding on the keys and looking at everybody and you don't know why and it's the same with some of the other characters yeah. they have the behavior without the setup now well, any minutes that they took out of this I think could have been a help maybe you didn't miss the setup coming up next more of the low points in our annual survey of the year's worst movies. You're on my list of the worst films of the year, and it has the ridiculous title of Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. Now, there's a premise you really <laughs> want to explain to your small children before they go off to the picture. Your babysitter could die at any moment. And when the babysitter does die at the beginning of this picture, that's when the oldest boy in the family, Keith Coogan, can go nuts, spend money, until Mom comes home from vacation. But before that, the oldest daughter, Christina Applegate, has to figure out a get-rich-quick scheme. The result? A bickering teenage brother and sister mimicking bickering adults. Helps. Kenny, the food that I brought yesterday is already gone. I was entertaining some friends last night, and we had the munchies. Look, I am not working to feed your scummy friends, okay? You're a career woman now. We can afford to be hospitable. Now, what message does that send out to young people? That the adult world of men and women is hell, and therefore the roles that we're trapped in as adults are just not worth playing. Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead is my least favorite kind of film, the TV sitcom as movie. There is nothing about this picture that has anything to do with the magic, dreamlike quality of movie making. So let me read off the names of those responsible for this junk. Writers Neil Landau and Tara Eisen, director Stephen Herrick, and producers Robert Newmeyer, Brian Riley, and Jeffrey Silver. They ought to be sentenced to a thousand hours of public service time as ushers in a shopping mall complex. Oh, you're in a bad mood today, well, Gene. Well, because, you know, I like this movie a little... It's a bad movie. It's a bad movie. Christina Applegate is an appealing actress. I hope this doesn't bring an end to her career. And I felt that she was able to reach probably a wish fulfillment level among some of the adolescent girls in the audience who would like to be able to dress up and get a job. The working girl and, story. And so, yeah, so that the fantasy of the movie is probably valid. It's just that it happens to be a real bad movie. Stuck in a bad script. Okay, my next choice of my year's worst films is a box office bomb. 
bomb that fell and exploded at the beginning of the summer season, and the fallout is still affecting the future of big-budget action pictures. The name of the movie was Hudson Hawk. This one starred Bruce Willis in an almost impenetrable plot involving an expert burglar who's released from prison only to find himself trapped in a scheme to steal three priceless Da Vinci's. I guess the movie wanted to be a slapstick action comedy, but there wasn't much that was funny in scenes like this one. of your body that you won't be needing for your next job. <laughs> I always did want to sing like Frankie Valley. Big boys don't cry I I. One thing I've learned about movie comedies over the years is that they're not debatable. Either you laugh or you don't. Now I watched Hudson Hawk in stony silence appalled by the way scene after scene fell flat. Maybe the same story could have been made into a funny film by another director able to find the punchlines of the gags and the scenes because somewhere there, there seemed to be promising material that was constantly being just missed. They were just over a little bit or just a second slow or just a line shy or they went on just a moment too long. So Hudson Hawk became a terrible case study of bad timing. Well, you know, I wasn't going to jump on, I didn't jump on this picture as hard as some other people. I think there, were, there was a lot of jumping on it because of the budget, which is a separate problem, I think, from what's on the screen. Yeah. And w what was on the screen, I admired the attempt. When they started out the picture with them uh, s singing a song mm -hmm. while doing a robbery, I thought, gee, I'd like, to, I'd like to see that. The problem then became that every scene was like that. This, there were no supporting characters. Yeah. When somebody came on, they took over center screen and did their shtick, mm -hmm. did their thing. Mm -hmm. There was no structure, no, it was just all at the highest level of, of would-be entertainment, mm -hmm. offbeat entertainment, and it all fell apart because there was no uh, balance to the picture at all. Okay, coming up next, more of the Dogs of 1991. You may kiss the bride. Yeah. Well, sorry, there's plenty of time for that on the honeymoon. You may kiss the bride. No, oh, not in front of all these people, Your Honor. Now! That's my next choice among the year's worst films, a truly amazingly bad comedy with a prescient name, Nothing But Trouble. The movie was directed by Dan Aykroyd, and he starred in it along with Chevy Chase and Demi Moore in the story of some yuppie New Yorkers who get hauled into a backwood speed trap. The occupants of the bizarre small town look like a three-way cross between the killers in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the creatures in Veal Juice, and the regulars on Hee Haw. How do you like your dog, folks? They're serving dogs? No, no, no. Hot dogs. Dutch country Herefords. Prize winners. Hot dogs. <laughs> Stadium Frank. You know, like they had before they brought in night games. And somewhere under all that late text is allegedly Dan Aykroyd. Nothing But Trouble is an example of a movie that's all but buried beneath makeup, special effects, and set decoration. The humor has to carry around such a heavy baggage of production values, so-called values, that it never gets off the ground. And besides, what's funny anyway about the grotesque creatures in this film? Yeah, I didn't think th that any of the stuff was funny at all. I was stunned by this picture. Uh, the original title was Valkenvania, and I think that they were <laughs> trying to do a Beetlejuice or some kind of otherworldly thing. But uh, the comedy seemed to be so contemporary. Mm -hmm. Saturday would be bad Saturday Night Live material that would be rejected on that show, mm -hmm. tossed in with these special effects and it just fell flat. I mean, I don't know if one per... So I think what happened is somebody made a draft at the beginning and then it got eaten away and eaten away and, and mm -hmm. safety material was thrown in so that the, the weirdness that might have been Valkenvania completely and lost. The, thing, the, the world in this movie, the visual yeah. world, is so aggressively ugly. Yes, it is ugly. That if it isn't a funny movie, which it isn't, then you're looking at the screen and you're just repelled, yeah. repelled by the images yes, exactly. that you're being subjected okay, to. Okay, next film, and my next choice is Dice Rules, but maybe not for the reason you suspect. Sure, Andrew Dice Clay is a Neanderthal woman hater, and his concert material is both ugly and unfunny, at least to me, but Dice Rules turns out to be more than just a concert movie. It also contains a pseudo-documentary autobiography before the concert begins, in which Clay shows us the kind of nerd he was before he got his anti-female religion. Is there way? Just a few moments. The eggs are bring it over here. I just want it to be the way you like it. Oh, 
like it. See, what's really offensive, it's one thing if his concert stuff fails, because that he can do. Now he's playing in the movie world, our world, and he's going to make some funny movie scenes. He can't do it. So it's kind of pathetic. He reveals himself, Andrew Dice Clay does, as a one-trick performer. It's a pretty, uh, the entire movie is a pretty unpleasant experience. It's very and, unpleasant. Uh, uh, once again, it's not funny, because oddly enough, I think our taste is probably bad enough that if it were funny we would laugh at it yes, even though we would feel ashamed of ourselves afterwards but here we were ready to laugh and nothing to laugh at coming up next in case you think you've already seen them you haven't these were worse than dice rules but i think i have one my choice of the very worst film of 1991 is according to me da -da -da -da. drop dead fred sort of a pseudo-psychological bad beetlejuice imitation they really wanted to imitate that picture this year the fred character being the drop dead fred character that is being the imaginary childhood pal of a put upon young woman played by phoebe cates whose mother is overbearing and whose husband she's on her eventually she goes to a shrink to talk about her pestering childhood friend get ready for one of the most obnoxious characters in movie history as fred is joined by some of his colleagues in crime That's Rick Mayall as Fred. He's a British actor on an MTV show. That's another reason not to watch MTV. Supposedly, he's her excuse to act out her anger. Uh, he can do the things that she'd like to do. But in the movie, he's just annoying to us because he's as real as anything in the movie. Too real. I had to sit through 98 minutes of his screaming act, 98 minutes stolen from my life. And it really, I, I thought it, it was real aggravating. You know, when Drop Dead Fred opened, I was on vacation. I was yeah. out of the country. When I came back, you had already seen it, and yeah. I asked you if I should see it, and you said it would be on your list of the worst movies of the year, although I didn't realize it was going to rank so high as number one, but I'm glad I didn't see it now that I see how high it was on your list. Consider it my holiday gift. Thank you very much. I, I have a feeling I truly appreciate that. And now my choice for the single worst film of 1991, which Gene has already said has the worst title of the year, yeah. Highlander 2, The Quickening. Now, this was the sequel to the original Highlander, not such a bad title, a cult film in some circles, but you'd have to be more than a cultist, you'd have to be a zombie to enjoy part two, The Quickening. The movie takes place at a time in the future when the Earth's ozone layer has been depleted and the planet huddles, huddles under some kind of protective shield that's administered by an evil international cartel. The film stars Sean Connery and Christopher Lambert as two immortals from the planet Zeist who find themselves in the middle of this situation. But if you can summon it all... of Highlander 2, The Quickening, is one of the most hilariously incomprehensible experiences I've had in a long time. This movie shows real evidence of having been edited almost at random. Let's take out this and this. And the science in the movie is just as crazy. I think in a way what got me, though, was the interlocking of all of these plots. The immortals from the planet Zeiss who are caught in a time warp of their own involving the fact that they got oriented in Scotland 500 years ago, plus events in uh, the year 1999 and more events in the year 2025, plus the cartel, plus the ozone shield, plus a mysterious killer, plus the beautiful independent scientist who exposes the secret of the ozone. You know, in a way, all of this insanity could have added up to something that would have made a great bad movie. But Highlander 2 is so crazily put together, you get the impression that a lot of the key scenes were just never filmed. It is pretty incomprehensible. Yeah. The only question I have is something you said earlier, which is that you'd have to be a zombie to enjoy this, and I'm not exactly sure why a zombie would. Well, you know, as a matter of fact, I don't think a zombie would like this film. That's how closely I listened. Probably okay. that's why you didn't like it. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with a special show on the Academy Award nominations. How about this for Academy members? Go out in a few days, and we're going to try and influence their votes by suggesting who they should nominate. We're not picking the obvious choices. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed. Kraft Touch of Butter Spread. It's made with rich, creamy butter. So when Kraft Touch of Butter says buttery taste, believe it. A touch of real butter makes a real difference. 
It's America's favorite jelly bean, Jelly Belly. Now appearing at theaters and video stores with good taste. Jelly Belly beans. Try them, you'll love them. For that special time in your child's life, bring home Walt Disney cartoon classics. Disney videos for your child's magic years. rice a -roni. Any day of the week, the flavor can't be beat. rice a -roni, the San Francisco treat.